Well, <clears throat> let's begin by reading our text, which is Galatians 3, uh, verses 1 through 14. Let me just give you a little bit of a, a warning that it, we're going to go a little bit beyond this, but just, just briefly to try to summarize the remainder of the content of this letter. But essentially, after Paul warns about um, uh, receiving of the gospel and that those who bring such a thing would be a curse, he then goes into elaborate detail regarding his own divine credentials, which he's already been emphasizing at the beginning. I didn't learn this gospel from someone else, but I received it by way of revelation. You need to listen to this. And this is where the rebuke, our text, this is where the rebuke uh, begins when he is just, as it were, flabbergasted, amazed that they could so quickly depart from the simplicity of the gospel, the gospel of God's grace, to that which is not really another gospel, but is a false doctrine of acceptance with God through works. So let's, uh, this is really the bulk of his rebuke, and in this rebuke we see many reasons why the Judaizers are wrong. Okay, so let's, let's begin. He says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham." The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Well, may the Lord bless um, his word to our hearing this morning and again confirm within us the, the true way of salvation. I'm experimenting here with a little additional water. I hope it doesn't distract you, but I often lose my voice by the end of the sermon I'm trying to prevent that. Okay. Well, today, we're again remembering the Reformation. Now, this year, it lines up to the day, okay, with the anniversary of Luther's nailing his 95 theses on the church door of Wittenberg on October the 31st, 1517, which is now 504 years ago, in which he was calling for a public debate, not on the use of indulgences, remember, but on the abuse of indulgences, uh, which many see as the beginning of the Reformation. Now, there's, again, differing views on when the Reformation begins. Was it when Luther was saved, uh, when he understood the gospel and the doors of heaven or paradise opened to him? Uh, was it when he, in arguing with the, with the church, saw that, you know, he wasn't going to be able to uh, reform the church from within and that it might very well cost him his life and that he had to be willing to pay that price? Was that when the Reformation began? Well, people see it differently, but this is generally seen as the beginning. But the Reformation, let's remember, was when the gospel, not when it was rediscovered, because there were those who believed the gospel throughout church history, but it was when the gospel was again publicly preached, the gospel of God's free grace, that we are saved by grace alone, received by faith alone, in Christ alone. 
Now, this obviously is important to understand because our tendency, really fallen man's tendency, even, well, we still have some corruption in our hearts, so it's still within us. Our tendency is to add something, something that we do, some work to what God has done so that we can take, as it were, part of the burden upon ourselves and with it part of the credit now, we do need to see that this is a recurring theme throughout Scripture, isn't it? Remember, when God made His covenant with Abraham, it was clear that God saved Abraham by His grace alone and that Abraham received it only by faith. Paul writes in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him or credited to him as righteousness. And yet, when Jesus comes into the world the Old Testament church leaders had turned that grace clearly into a system of works. That is what Paul is addressing in this letter. He had come to Galatia on his first missionary journey. He established the church there through the preaching of the gospel among the Gentiles. But it wasn't long before the Judaizers, and again, the Judaizers are those who accepted Jesus as the Messiah. They believed in him. But they also believed that they needed to keep the Jewish traditions, circumcision, and observing the law of Moses. And they began to teach these new believers that they needed to do the same. They were adding works to the grace of God. Now, Luther faced a similar problem in his day. Justification was no longer seen as God's work through Jesus Christ alone, even though that was so clearly proclaimed in, in the New Testament scriptures. I mean, <clears throat> we see it here in the book of Galatians. We see it in Romans. We see it shot through Scripture. That it's, you know, it's God's work through Christ given freely to those who trust Him. They no longer saw it that way, but as something they had to earn. Let me just again remind you of the Roman view of justification. You are not justified by the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ received by faith alone. Rather, you receive grace through the sacraments and then you work really hard in order to become good enough through that grace for God to justify you or to accept you. In other words, justification doesn't happen until sanctification takes place. We believe instead that God justifies us through the righteousness of another and then we are just in Christ, and then he begins the process of sanctification. So Rome fell under the same error. They're adding works to this justification. And what I want us to consider this morning is that the arguments that Paul uses here to refute the Judaizers also refutes Rome's view of justification. Now, these are the arguments that we should use whenever we try to minister to those who believe that they have to work to earn God's favor. And these are the same arguments we need to use on ourselves when we begin to think that unless we measure up, God will not accept us. Or unless, you know, we sort of measure up, God's not going to keep us. He's going to boot us out of the family of God unless we do X number of good works or good things, unless we as it were, behave the way we should behave. Now, Paul gives us several arguments here in, in these 14 verses. And there's a couple more perhaps beyond that. So we're just going to look at each of them briefly. So first of all, Paul begins by pointing out to the Galatians how they were saved. They were saved by faith. Notice in verse 2, Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith. And by the way, this comes after a rebuke, a rebuke to wake them up, to get them to pay attention. He says, are you really so foolish? In other words, you, you need to use your heads here. Who has bewitched you? Who has pulled the wool over your eyes? Who has deceived you? You know better than this. He says, Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified before your eyes. Now, he's not saying they saw the crucifixion. But what he is saying is, you heard the truth through my preaching that Jesus died to save you. 
that he is the one who did the work, okay? And that's now what he's going to launch into. But first of all, I want us to consider this. Sometimes when we're trying to make a point, especially if it happens to be a very important point, we need to speak with a little bit more force. When we see a brother or sister straying from the truth and they need to listen to us, this is what we call a rebuke or a reproof or an admonition. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2 that this is something he should be doing on a regular basis, and this is what the Word of God is to be doing for us. He says, preach the Word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. That's what preaching is. Reproving, rebuking, exhorting. And, you know, exhorting, by the way, means encouraging. So it's not all you know, the rebuke, as it were, but there's also encouragement and there's patience and instruction. Sometimes we need to do that for some of our brothers and sisters in the Lord when we see them going astray. Sometimes we need to be rebuked. And when that happens, we need to humbly receive it because it's for our good. David writes in Psalm 141, verse 5, let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. It is oil upon the head. Do not let my head refuse it. So this is what Paul's doing for the Galatians, and they need to hear this because otherwise they're going to fall away from the grace of God. Now, they couldn't really ultimately do that if they were genuinely saved, but Paul wants to make sure they're not deceived. He wants them to know the true way of salvation. So how exactly did the Galatians come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul asks, how did you receive the Spirit, the gift that Jesus gives through His work, the one who works the kind of love that we need, not only to believe in the Lord, but also to obey Him? Paul is asking, did He give you the Holy Spirit through the works of the law, in other words, when you finally became good enough, then He finally gave you his, his Holy Spirit. Or did you receive the Holy Spirit? By faith. Well, of course, they knew it was by faith. They knew that they were already saved and trusting in Jesus Christ. And the Judaizers came after that, after they were already saved. So how could there be then something more that they needed if they already had what it is that God had to give? And they had received it by faith and not by any works. And then he goes on to ask them, what about your growth into the image of Christ? You, you, you know, will the Lord who started this work in your hearts, who gave you the Holy Spirit, now leave the rest of it up to you to complete? He says, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Well, obviously, no. Remember what Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 1 verse 6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul is saying you can no more sanctify yourselves than you can save yourselves. Both of these things are the work of the Holy Spirit, and I'd say by this time they had already experienced a bit of this growth in grace and knew that it came through the operation of the Spirit within them and not through their obedience to the law. Now, what happened, he goes on to say, to that conviction that you also had before, your willingness to endure whatever you had to for the gospel. He says in verse 4, Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Now, what he's referring to here is the persecution that the Galatian believers had suffered at the hands of the Jewish community for believing that they could have a relationship with God apart from Judaism, essentially, apart from Moses, apart from circumcision and the traditions. Paul is reminding them, didn't you already endure many things because your conviction was so strong in these truths? Now are you willing to say that was all for nothing? Well... When we're tempted to give up the faith because things get difficult for us, because things get hard, we need to look at what it is we were already willing to pay and ask ourselves the question, why were we willing to do that? And what happened to my conviction? Why has it changed? And is there really a good reason for it to change? 
Paul is saying, no, you paid that price for a good reason. And it's because God saved you by his Holy Spirit through the gospel. Now, Paul shifts gears and he moves into a second round of arguments. And I want you to see this time he begins to argue, not from experience, but rather from Scripture. Now, so far, Paul has been arguing two of the Reformation principles. And by the way, Paul isn't arguing them because they're Reformation principles. We understand that. Reformation came later, right? But this is where the Reformation got them, okay? That justification is by God's grace alone. And for it to be by grace alone, as a free gift alone, it has to be received by faith alone and not by any works that earn anything. Now, the Roman church, remember, believes that we are saved, and this sounds amazing, that we are saved by God's grace alone. They believe that we need that grace. The Judaizers believe that we needed God's grace too, right? They believe they needed Jesus and they needed his sacrifice. But both of these groups believe that Jesus is not enough by himself. There is something more that we need, something more that we need to do. Now, as I've said, so far Paul has appealed to the Galatians' experience, how they were saved, how they were growing in grace, how they had been willing to suffer. But he also understands that experiences can be deceiving other religions have experiences. If you talk to a Mormon, his main reason for his belief is that he had some kind of experience in, in his bowels, as it were, this burning of the bosom, and that alone is enough to convince him that these things are true. But you see, we can be deceived by our experiences. I think if, if the charismatic movement teaches us anything, it teaches us we have to be wary of our experiences, not that there aren't genuine experiences of the Holy Spirit, when he leads and guides us and gives us love for the Lord and so forth, but we can't expect him to be guiding us that way. It has to be through the Word. And that's why we always need to bring our experience to the Word because it is the only thing that will not deceive us. And so now Paul points to another Reformation principle, if I can put it that way, the Scripture alone. Now, the Judaizers accepted Scripture as the final rule. We're going to be reminded this evening that Rome did not. They had other authorities. They had their tradition. They had the Pope's teaching ministry of the church. They had councils. They had the church fathers. The tradition, the growing tradition, and these things trumped the Bible. Okay? But the Judaizers respected this. So Paul begins to argue from that perspective and certainly these Galatian believers respected this. Now, he, he first of all appeals to miracles. And I wanted to put this under the category of Scripture because this is how the Lord proves the one who is speaking is speaking His Word. Paul says in verse 5, So then, does He who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now, remember during these early days when the gospel was first being preached, before the New Testament canon was completed, the Lord authenticated His messengers through miracles. This is how He proved what they were saying was the Word of God. So when Paul preached the gospel to the Galatians, there were miracles. God enabled him to do miracles, but when the Judaizers preached, there were no miracles. God would not endorse their false gospel. So how do we prove that the gospel that we have actually comes from God, that it is the truth? Well, we point to the miracles. First of all, we look at the miracles that are recorded in the Bible, but we also point to those miracles, the miracles that God did when he gave the scriptures to establish them. So Paul here is saying, and again, he's emphasized over and over again his divine credentials. I've received this revelation from God. I was sent by God. Now I've done miracles. You know, God has enabled me to do these miracles. And this is to prove to you that what I'm speaking to you is the Word of God. And as a matter of fact, it's written in, you know, in the Bible here. It's a part of the canon. It is the Word of God. Now, not leaving it there, 
as the Bereans, remember, they always were searching the Scriptures to make sure that what Paul was telling them was the truth, even though he had these divine credentials. Secondly, Paul points to those Scriptures, to the Old Testament Scriptures, to show them how Abraham was saved. Verse 6, Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, Abraham was, was recognized by the Jews. As a matter of fact, uh, the, even the, the Muslims accept Abraham as the father of their religion. Certainly, the Jews did as the one God chose with whom to make his covenant along with his children. And these Jews are his children, the heirs of that covenant. Well, how was Abraham saved? Well, Paul says he didn't work to earn God's favor. It's not Abraham worked and God credited to him as righteousness, but Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. But then who are the children of Abraham? Is it those who are the natural offspring who are trying to justify themselves through their works? He says, no, it is those who believe. Verse 7, therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. And what about the Gentiles? And remember, the Galatians were Gentiles. How did the Scriptures say that they would be saved? Well, Paul says in verses 8 and 9, the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. Abraham himself was saved by faith. His children are saved by faith, even the, the Jews. And so are the Gentiles. But I want you to notice here that Paul is not yet finished. He's made an argument from experience. Now he's made an argument from Scripture. He's going to make a second argument now from Scripture, but this time... He makes what's called an, an ad hominem argument, if you can put it that way. In other words, he takes the position of the opponent and then he shows just, you know, the, well, the absurdity of this position, that, that they are wrong. So he next asks the question, why was the law given in the first place? Now, clearly, God never gave it to save them. As a matter of fact, God even warned them ahead of time that attempt, you know, an attempt to do so would actually place them under a curse. I told you before that when God uh, brought His people into the land, the Israelites, the first thing they were supposed to do, and if you were reading the Bible together with us, you, you read about that. It was commanded in Deuteronomy, but it was fulfilled in Joshua, and after they came into the land, they stood on those two mountains to utter the blessings and the curses. Now, some Israelites stood on Mount Ebal and they pronounced the curses and they were to conclude with these words, Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. Cursed is he who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them and all the people shall say, Amen. Now this is what Paul is referring to in verse 10 when he says this, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. He's, he is quoting Deuteronomy 27. So this is the curse God pronounced upon His people even back then that if they tried to justify themselves by their works, they would put themselves under the curse. Now Paul is basically again, directing this against the Judaizers and trying to wake up the Galatians. If you want to try to justify yourself through the law, if you do not do everything that the law says, you are under the curse. You have brought a curse upon yourself far from justifying yourselves. Now, beyond that, we could also say this. The fact that they break the law, the Jews originally, the, the, the Judaizers, the, the Galatian believers, the fact that we do this by nature, shows that we're already under a curse. We're under a curse uh, that, that came upon us from the covenant that God made with Adam, remember. Uh, 
when Adam broke that curse as our representative broke that covenant, he brought a curse on us as our representative. The problem is works, law, obedience as a means for justification can only bring curse. It cannot bring blessing because we cannot keep it perfectly. Now, when Jesus kept it perfectly, it brought blessing because he could keep it perfectly. But we cannot do that. The only way we can be saved is by God's grace. That's why justification, acceptance with God, has to be by faith. Paul writes in verses 11 and 12, Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. And again, let me just remind you that um, you know, grace and, and works are on two opposite ends of the spectrum, right? Faith is a free gift. Works is something that you get paid for, something that you earn something by. Uh, they cannot mix because of the fact that they are opposites. And that's what Paul is reminding them. It cannot be by faith and by works. It cannot be by grace and by your obedience. It has to be one or the other. Well, it can't be works because those who do this are under the curse. It has to be by faith. It's always been by faith. God grants righteousness on the basis of faith. Now, Paul finally reminds them in our passage that if they could have been saved by keeping the law, then why would the Father have sent Jesus into the world to suffer and die on the cross? It would have been for no reason. Verses 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, he makes it a little bit clearer. Just a few verses later, in verse 21, he says this, If a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But you see, it isn't based on law because there was never a law given that could give us righteousness. And that's why he sent Jesus into the world to take our curse upon himself so that we might be freed from that curse. Paul's argument is the law was never given to take the place of grace. This is where we go a little bit out of our text. God gave it instead to show us our need of grace. Chapter 3, verse 22. The Scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, Paul, finally, in, in the letter, in the remainder of the letter, I think we've already established, Paul is clearly telling us here, we're not saved by our works, we're saved by grace through faith alone. And your experience, the Scriptures tell us that's what it is. Not only was Abraham saved in that way, not only his children, not only does it, does it basically foretell Gentile salvation in that way, but... Everyone who tries to justify themselves by works falls under the curse. Okay, so Paul, to this point, has very soundly condemned any idea of working your way to salvation. So, the one last point I want us to see is this, that Paul wants us to see. The fact that we cannot be justified by the law does not mean that God doesn't want us to keep the law. Okay, that's, that's the confusion, I think, that comes into a lot of evangelical churches. Oh, if you try to keep the law, you're a legalist. If you try to keep the law, then you've fallen under the curse. I'm going to stay away from that curse. I'm not going to obey the law. Well, no, that's not the response that the Lord wants. We are, that only applies to justification, our acceptance with God. He will never accept us by our works. But let's not forget, God actually saved us so that we would keep the law. He sent Jesus into this world to live and to die that he might give us the Holy Spirit not only to work faith in our hearts but to write the law of God upon our hearts to give us the power to obey God's will. In other words, to put it simply, to give us the ability to love what is good so that we'll want to do what is good, just like Jesus. 
You know, Jesus loved his father and he loved his neighbor. And when he did it, he did it the way the commandments, the law of love told him to do it because his heart was so full of love and that's what he wanted to do. Well, Jesus gives us a spirit to fill our hearts with love so that that is what we also want to do. And guess what? We do what we want to do. And that's how we can tell that we have the grace of God in our hearts, how we've been justified, is that we see that love at work. We see ourselves living the way Jesus lived. Now, again, that isn't legalism. We're not doing that to try to make ourselves acceptable to God or even to stay within His family. It's, it's love, okay? It's evangelical obedience. It's simply showing love to the one who first loved us. And that's, that's really the whole point of the letter. And that's really the whole point of the Reformation, okay? is simply trying to get the works out of the equation, going back to the free grace of God received by faith alone. So let me, in closing, just, just say this, because really we've looked at all the Reformation principles in this brief uh, sermon. God tells us in His Word alone that He has done all that we need through His Son alone. And He offers us to us by His grace alone in the gospel and that it might be by grace alone we can only receive it by faith alone so that God alone might receive all the glory for our salvation. That, that's what the Reformation is all about. Now this evening we'll see uh, how the Lord not only showed Martin Luther this truth and how his life was transformed by it, but that very important point that we, that we maybe sometimes miss. There were other people who discovered the gospel who may have even written about it in, in their private writings but didn't want to go out publicly with it because they knew the church condemned it and they would die if they published it and they weren't willing to pay that price. Luther not only discovered it, but Luther was willing to preach it. God gave him the courage to do this and that's what makes the Reformation possible. And that's what I want us to be encouraged by this evening is this truth as well as what the Lord did with this truth through the life of, of really just one man, a greatly gifted man, a very courageous man. This is the kind of courage, by the way, that the Lord calls us to have, isn't it? This is why we have to be willing to lay down our lives, to pick up our crosses, to follow Jesus, because this is the kind of commitment that we have to have. If this belief that we have is going to do good to anyone more than us, if we're going to share it with other people, we have to have this kind of courage and be willing to suffer whatever we might have to suffer in order to bring it to others. Well, on that note, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask for the Lord's grace to be able to do that.